right, if you've got a Bible, grab it, open it, turn it on, follow along in your outline on screen or on the Central Church app. If you don't have the Central Church app, um, I encourage you to get that because you can follow along um, with the Bible verses on there. There is a Bible version on there, and the, uh, the outline is also on there that you can electronically fill out and then email it to yourself. Um, but Daniel chapter 3, that's where we're going to start at today. Uh, we're starting a brand new series again um, called all aboard. And over the next several weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to challenge you to understand that the gospel, the gospel costs absolutely nothing, but it demands everything. And it demands that we get on board with God's plans for our lives and and we leave our plans behind. And and so um, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about um, getting on board with following Jesus, with being committed to the church, with, with bas- not basically, but just all, being all in, being all aboard and giving Jesus everything that we have. All of us saying, hey Jesus, all of me for all of you. Um, we're going to talk about surrendering, we're going to be talk about um, coming together, we're going to be talking about all kinds of, of different ways that we get all aboard with what Jesus wants for our lives. Let me set today up like this. Um, on January 8th, 1992, so 30 years ago yesterday, uh, I was in a car accident that literally changed the course of my life. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the whole story because many of you have, have heard it before. The short version, I wrapped my 1988 Yugo around a tree, and it literally was one of those I should be dead accidents. It was, it was absolutely terrible. Um, But one of the few things that I remember as I was laying in the car, literally bleeding to death, is I was watching car after car drive past me. Like I'm going in and out of consciousness and and I'm watching cars drive past. Now here's what's absolutely crazy. 95% or so of those cars that were on that road, they were on that road on their way to their Sunday night church service. There was a great big huge church in the town um, that I lived in, and the main road to get to the church um, was, was the road that I crashed on. That was the road you took to get there. Um, finally, a guy stopped. Um, he came up to the car. He looked at me. He said, oh, <laughs> I think you need an ambulance. And I'm like, I think you might be right. Um, or a hearse. I don't know. Some one of them. But so he sent his, one of his kids or his wife, I, I don't really know, up to a house to call 911. This was before cell phones. We didn't carry cell phones in our pockets. If you were super rich, you had a car mounted or a phone mounted in your car. How many of you had a, a phone mounted in your car way back then? Sweet. Um, I, I didn't. I think I had a bag phone or was getting ready to go. I don't know. Anyway, um, he just didn't have one. And so he ran up there. And, 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 and here's, here's kind of the point. Um, what stood out to me was in that situation, that guy stayed with me the entire time until the paramedics got there. And when the paramedics got there, neither them or him gave me a lecture. They didn't, didn't give me a lecture on how to drive. They didn't yell and scream at me and tell me how idiotic I had been. They didn't give me a book on learning how to drive on slick roads. And Anybody ever done that to you? Anybody ever given you a book and say, hey, I read this. It was great. I think you ought to read it. Try not to suck at life. <laughs> right? And they didn't do that. They just went to work to get me out of the car and save my life. And I've never forgotten that moment. And it really is the idea behind the message today. Because if you don't get anything else to say today, get this. If we're going to make it through life, we really do need the help of Jesus. Like Jesus needs to be the center of our lives. He he really does. Everything that we do needs to be for Jesus. Our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus. But we do need the help of others as well. We can't do life alone. And so if we're going to make it through life, we need the help of Jesus and others. And listen, I know people that say, all I need is Jesus. That's all I need. I just need Jesus. That is the biggest spiritual cop-out I've ever heard in my life. Because think about Jesus. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was arrested. Was he alone, yes or no? No, he needed other people around him. Now, I've also heard people say, I need Jesus, or I need others. I just don't need Jesus. Listen, when you discount Jesus, You also discount the supernatural taking place in our lives, Jesus doing things that we could never, ever possibly imagine. And so when it comes to really being successful in life or taking, in our spiritual life, taking spiritual steps 
forward. We, we need to embrace a, a, a phrase that you've probably heard before. It's, it's popular in sports. It's we is greater than me. All right? and, 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 and one of the things that we want for everyone who walks through the doors of this church is we want you to understand that, that we embrace that, this idea that, that we're together or we're better together than alone. And you're not alone in the fire that you happen to be going through. I love what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30. Um, this isn't going to pop up on screen, but, but it says, how could one person chase a thousand? Think about that. Think about one person chasing a thousand people. Now, that's a pretty impressive dude or girl, right? Like, like chasing that. But, but watch what happens next. It says, how, how can one person chase a thousand and two people put 10,000 to flight? So one could chase a thousand, but with two, our potential increases exponentially. And so I want to show you this through a story about three guys in the Bible. You've probably heard of them before. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when we first meet them in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, they're in, they're in Israel. And Israel had kind of been in revolt and rebellion against Babylon. And Babylon comes in and they're invading. And when Babylon came in to invade a country, they would come in and they would take some of the smartest and the brightest people. This would be like if we decided we wanted to um, invade a college and we would take like the top two or three percent of people um, in the academic world and we would bring them back and we would make them work for us. That's what they would do. They would go in, they would take the best and the brightest and they would ship them off to Babylon. Um, they would re-educate them and actually give them a government job. They would, uh, they would be on staff because they were the best the brightest people, the greatest minds um, available, and, and they would redirect them. And so that's how we meet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so Israel falls, Jerusalem falls, they were captured, they're taken into captivity, and they went through some pretty tough times. In Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2, we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as well as a guy named Daniel, go through some really, 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 really difficult scenarios. But in Daniel chapter 3 is where stuff gets really tough. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego work for a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is like an egomaniac. The guy built um, an idol. 90 feet tall and nine feet wide out of solid gold. It was a statue of himself. Like, I've heard people say that people who take selfies are arrogant. No, people that build statues 90 feet tall and nine feet wide out of solid gold, they're arrogant, right? That's a, that's a big deal. So he builds this, this, this idol, 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, and then he says this, we're gonna have a concert. And when the music starts, everyone's going to bow down. Now for me, and probably for you, we're going to be like, nope, I'm out. I'm going to bow down. That's stupid. Dumbest thing I've ever heard. Then they throw in this warning. Hey, if you don't bow down, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be thrown into a burning furnace. You're going to be burned alive. Hmm. Bowing down don't sound too bad, right? And so to the ancient Babylonians, this wasn't a big deal. To us, we'd be like, nope. I don't know, don't think so, that's the wrong thing to do. But the Babylonians would bow down to different gods all the time. This was very common in their practice. But to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were Jewish, this was a very big deal. Because they were told over and over again in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, um, they were told not to bow down to idols. They, they had the Ten Commandments, right? They, they understood that. You know that commandment. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. They knew that. They bought into that. They believed in that. So for them, this would clearly be the wrong thing to do. So they had to make a decision. Are we going to blend in or are we going to stand? out. And I think that's an incredible question for us to ask as well, whether it be as individuals um, in our community, whether it be here in, in the church or just in Christianity altogether, are we going to just blend in or are we going to stand out? Are we going to blend in or are we going to stand out? What are you going to do? Do you want to be somebody who just blends into everything or do you actually want to stand out for Jesus? Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the music played, and guess what they didn't do? They didn't bow. Everybody else bows down, but Shadrach and the Meshach and Abednego didn't do it. Now, here's what's cool about that that I think stands out really, really great. They didn't start yelling and freaking out about everything. 
They didn't start a boycott against bowing. They didn't yell at people for being idiots for bowing. They simply did the right thing. And do you know that you can sometimes do the right thing and not talk about it? You don't have to brag about it. You just do it. And when you do it, you just stand out and people take notice and people see it. And that speaks into people's lives. Did you know that? So are you going to blend in or are you going to stand out? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they make the choice, we're going to stand out. They did the right thing. And I just want to point out here too, just because this is, this is super important, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood together. They were unified in this. They were united. They were on the same page. They were absolutely 100% on board with each other. And then this, gets, this is where it gets interesting because Daniel tells us in verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar, when, when, when he found out they didn't, they didn't bow down, then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a fit of rage. Now, quick question. How many of you know you're going to make a stupid decision as soon as you fly into a fit of rage? How many of you know that? How many of you know that about the person sitting next to you right now? <laughs> I, I have never, ever, 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 ever made a smart decision when I lost my temper. And, and, and neither have you. As parents, how many of you are parents? Don't we say stupid things to our kids when we lose our temper? Don't we? If you cut your leg off of that lawnmower, don't come running back to me. <laughs> All right, freak, whatever. <laughs> he gets furious with rage. And then watch this. Furious with rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true? Like, like he's shocked by this. And the reason why is because Nebuchadnezzar had a relationship with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were, again, remember, they're, they're kind of like essentially on staff. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 2, we see that they're not strangers to each other. They knew each other. It's very important. This wasn't the first time that they had met. They knew each other. And so he's like, is it true? And in other words, like, like boys, they're telling me this. And I, from you three, like, I, I can't. I can't believe this. Like, there's, there's no way that you're not bowing down. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance. Listen, I love second chances, don't you? I believe in second chances. I believe we have a God of second chances and third chances and 80th chances and 567th chances and on and on and on, right? Aren't you glad for that? But did you know that the devil will also give you another chance? You know that? Did you know the devil will give you another chance? Think about it. Isn't it funny sometimes you think you've got a temptation beat, and then two days later, you're facing the same exact thing. Anybody struggle with that other than me? I'm victorious. Yes. And then two days later, crap, I did it again. It's this pressure. I'll talk about this in a minute. It's this pressure thing that the enemy puts on us. Because watch this, verse 15. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? He, he said this because he knew the God they serve. He knew that they were Jewish. He, he, that he knew they believed in God, the same God that, that we believe in. He knew that. And so he's picking a fight with God. Is that going to go well for him, yes or no? No, and we know it's not going to go well for him, but they hadn't read that yet, right? They didn't have Daniel chapter 3, so they didn't know that. But he's putting pressure on them. He's, he's the enemy to them now, and he's putting all of this pressure. At the end of the day, when we should choose to do the right thing, when we choose to stand out and not blend in, the enemy is going to apply pressure to our lives. And we don't make it through that without the help of God or without the help of others. We need the help of others to make it through difficult situations. A, a while back, I was talking to a friend um, on the phone. He was driving on an interstate in Indianapolis. And, and all of a sudden, he starts freaking out. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, my tire just blew out. And so he pulls over to the side of the road. He says, I have to call you back. 10 minutes later, not kidding you, 10 minutes later, he calls me back. He's like, everything's good, man. I'm back on the road. And he's talking like everything is just fine. I'm like, hold on, hold on. Did you like pull into an IndyCar pit lane or something? Like, how did you change your tires? Because 
like, listen, he's probably not watching this, but I know this dude, all right, and he ain't the most handy person. Like, it would take me three days to change a tire. Like, it's probably like four months for him. But anyway, he's like, no, 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 it's crazy. A state trooper pulled up behind me, and a, and a tow truck that was leaving the scene of an accident that pulled up with him, and they got out, and they changed my tire for me and put me back on the road. He's like, it was amazing, and it was amazing. It's, it was crazy, and, and that was a, a reminder to me that sometimes— we feel like everything's going along great in life. You, you ever feel like that? Like everything is just great. And then all of a sudden the tire blows and you're on the side of the road and you don't know what to do because I don't have the skills to do this. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I, I, don't, I don't have a jack. I don't have, I don't have a spare tire. I don't even know where it's at. I don't know. Is it in the front? Is it back? Is it underneath? Like what's going on? But it's with the help of Jesus and the help of others that gets us through that situation. And one of the things that we need to understand and we need to start thinking about is, yes, I, I, I have this relationship with Jesus. I've got Jesus as the center of my life. I'm walking with Jesus, but who are the people that are going to be on board with me? Who are your on board people? Who are they? And, and the reason I say that is because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, listen, they knew this was coming. Keep this in mind. They worked for the king. They were on staff with the government. You can't hide the fact that you're building a 90-foot tall, 9-foot wide, solid gold statue. What is that? Nothing to see here. Just keep moving on. Just keep going. They knew what was going on. They knew what the intention for the statue was while the statue was being built. They knew eventually the king was going to say, I want everybody to bow down. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I can almost imagine a conversation between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where they sat down and they just kind of locked eyes with each other and they got on board with the plan. What was going to happen? Guys, hey, he's going to make us bow down. We're not going to do it, right? We're, we're going to do the right thing. Like, I'm going to support you and I'm going to support you and you two are going to support me. Like, we're going to stand together. Even if we get thrown in the furnace, we're going to stand together because we serve God and, and we know what God would want us to do. And, and God is able to rescue us and God is able to take, hey, 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 guys, let's, let's just say that we're on board with each other no matter what happens. That's the difference maker. Who, who, who's on board with you? Who's on board with, with the plan and the purpose that God has for your life? Who's on board with you? Who are your onboard people? Who are your ride or dies? Who are the people who aren't judging you? I, I have people tell me all the time, I got lots of people, Ryan, really? Really? Let all hell break loose in your life. That's when you'll find out who's on board with you, right? So yeah, you got people who say, I love you, but they followed up with a but. I love you, but. I love you, but, you know, here's some things that you really need. If you really want me to love you deep, like, you got to do this. I love you if. I mean, if you do this, and then I'll love you. On board people, truly on board people, just say, I love you. I love you, period. No matter what. No matter who you are. No matter what's going on. No, no matter anything. I love you. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Onboard people make a difference when we go through our trials because when we're surrounded with onboard people, li listen, with the help of Jesus and the help of other people who are on board with us, we can literally overcome anything that the world throws at us. We will never do it alone. You can't do life alone. But with the help of Jesus and the help of others, you can overcome. And so I believe this conversation happened because they had their mind made up before they even went into the situation. And then this happens in verse 16. They answer the king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego applied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not. And, and I think they get kind of excited at this point. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. I love that. Because how many of you know that when it comes to your life, you don't have to defend yourself? You do not have to defend yourself. How many of you know you have a God who's fighting for you, who loves you, who says no weapon formed against you will ever prosper, who will defend you? He's fought battles for us. We're not even where he has fought. I'm so glad I have a God who will fight for me instead of against me. Aren't you? Can somebody say amen right there? Love that. It gets better though. Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able 
to save us. How many of you know you have a God who's able to save you? He's able to save you. He's able to save you from anything the world throws at you. He's able to save you from depression, from anxiety, from worry, from addiction. He's able to rescue us from anything we go through. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And at this point, you're thinking, yes! Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, get him! Tell him! Tell him exactly what our God will do. Our God will bring the beat down upon him. And then it gets real. It gets difficult. And it gets hard. Because verse 18 says this. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, see, not a lot of amens right there. Right. God will fight for us. Yeah! God will save us. Yes! God will deliver us. Woo! He might not. Oh, dang. But see, they face that possibility. They're like, hey, we know God can move. We know God can work. We know God can do this. But even if he doesn't, and then watch this, even if he doesn't, we, even if he doesn't, we, 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 that's key. Even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Now, maybe you're looking at this and you're saying, that's not very good theology, even if he doesn't. I mean, come on. God does everything. Because you've been told if you do the right things, he'll move, right? You've been told if you do the right things... He'll save you. But what I've discovered is we live in a world where bad things really do happen to good people. Yes, that sucks to hear. It sucks to say. But the reality of life is there have been some really bad things that have happened to some really good people. Yes or no? Yeah. And there are probably some people in this room, you're going through something that maybe you yourself never thought that you would go through. Or you feel like you're in the middle of a fire you never saw coming. And maybe you believe it's because of what you've done. Or maybe it's because you believe that you're a bad person or a horrible person, but that's not the case at all. Because let me ask you this question. How? How would we know God is a healer if we never get put in situations where we needed to be healed? How would we know God is a provider if we were never put in situations where we need his provision? How would we know God is able to save if we weren't put in situations that we literally needed to be saved from? See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew this, and they're saying, listen, we know God can. We know God is able, but even if he doesn't, so I'm going to bow down. That's what onboard people do. They stay together. They stick with you no matter what. See, when it comes to onboard people and people in our life, the people that you need to have in your life, whether you're being onboard for them or they're being onboard for you, it's not what they say. It's not even if they pray, it's whether or not they stay. The people in our life, the people I need in my life, the people you need in your life, it's not what they say to me. It's not whether or not they're going to pray for me, it's whether or not they're going to stay with me. Same thing with you. Are they going to stick with you? Are they going to walk through the fire with you? Because I've heard people say, and you've, you've heard people say this too, oh, I got your back, I'm right there with you. I got your back, but that's only to see where they can put the knife so you can't get to it to reach to pull it out, right? Or have you ever had somebody say, they'll pray for you? You you know what? I know people who say they'll pray for you, but they will never, ever talk to you. You ever met that person? I'm praying for you, and then you see them out in public, and and they, like, treat you like you're a leper. Ah, unclean! You got fluorona! Ah! Right? On board, people. We'll stand with you no matter what, even when you go through the fire. And you don't forget onboard people because onboard people stick with you no matter what. Now, at this point in the story, this is where you would expect for God to just move in and rescue them, right? Because they've done the right things. They've said the right things. They stood up to the enemy. You would expect God to just come in and just blow up Nebuchadnezzar or send a lightning bolt to melt down the gold statue or whatever. But that's not what happens. Look at this, verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. You ever see that person? You ever become that person? Usually in traffic or Walmart. That's how I get when I go to Walmart. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. 
See, this is what I've got to understand. This is what you've got to understand. This is what we need to learn to understand. Sometimes, sometimes we do the right thing, and then what we step into, it isn't what we thought it was going to be. It's actually worse. How many of you know sometimes when you do the right thing, the heat gets turned up seven times hotter? They, they don't get better. They, they get worse. And we wind up scratching our head going, what in the world is happening and, and what did I do wrong? Because I felt like if I lived for Jesus, everything would be great. But right here in the Bible, these guys are, are essentially living for Jesus and it gets seven times hotter. And then verse 20, then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Sent some of the strongest men to bind them, to bind them, to bind them. To What? to bind them. Did you know that the devil will send some of the strongest demons in hell to bind you, to discourage you, to beat you down? And, and here's why. Because he knows if he can get you to break down, that you'll never experience a breakthrough. And, and, and the reason some of you feel like you're on the verge of a breakdown is because God is getting ready to bring a breakthrough into your life, something, something bigger than you could ever ever, ever possibly imagine. And so what you need to hear today is don't give in to the breakdown, hold on for the breakthrough. Because, because think about this. Why would the devil be attacking you so diligently if you were not a threat to him? Like, I hope you don't let the devil see more potential in you than God sees in you. You are alive and breathing. You are on this planet because God loves you, has a plan for your life bigger than anything you could ever possibly imagine. And you need to get on board with his plan because if you're going through the fire, it's not because you're bad, it's because he wants you to see something that without the fire, you would have never seen. Be because watch what happens to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is awesome. Verse 21. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace. This is really bad. Threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed. Don't miss that. The flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Watch this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied securely tied. How tied? Securely tied. Fell into the roaring flames. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, on the my day sucks scale, this is a 10. Can we agree? I mean, getting thrown into the furnace is bad, but you're tied up, thrown in the furnace, this is bad. And the reason I'm making a big deal out of securely tied is because, like, Verse 24 says this. I'll talk about this in a second. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and excitement to his advisors. Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Like, I, I don't know how he saw this. I've always wondered this. I don't know if they had like a jumbotron or what, how he saw this. But somehow he's watching the whole thing. Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. They replied, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed and the fourth looks like a god. The reason he looked like a god is because he was the son of God. Don't miss this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not see Jesus until they got into the fire. Sometimes we don't see his presence until we step into the fire. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't see his presence until we step into the fire. Now, a couple of points to make here. They went into the fire. Remember, I, I told you that they were, they were tied. How tied are they? Securely tied. Right here it says they're unbound. And what I love about this, and what I get out of this, is what the enemy put on them, Jesus took off of them with the very thing that was meant to destroy them. Do you, do you see that? What the enemy, what Nebuchadnezzar put on them when he bound them up, Jesus took off of them with the very thing, the fire, that was meant to destroy them. What the enemy put on them, Jesus took off of them with the very, that, that's incredible. See, that really does prove that he takes graves and turns them into gardens. He takes broken things, puts them back together. He takes dead things and brings them back into life. They were thrown into the fire bound, but right here they're unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed. Let me ask you this question. Do you think when they're in the fire with Jesus, do you think they had peace, yes or no? Yes. You think they had joy, yes or no? Yes. You think they had hope? 
Yes, absolutely. I believe they had peace, joy, and hope, but they didn't receive those things until they got into the fire. And when they got into the fire, they saw Jesus in a way that they would never had seen them had they not gone through the fire that they had to go through. And for those of you who feel like you might be in a fire, all I would tell you is this, stop. Stop and look around because you're getting ready to see him in ways that you have never seen him before because he always, always, everybody say always. He always shows up in the fire. I love, I love this next verse, verse 26. And then Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace. Remember, he, he, he can only go so far because the other soldiers that threw them in, they got killed. They got burned up. And so he got to some kind of point, I don't know how far away it was or whatever, where he just felt the heat and was like, hey, no more. I, I, I can't go any farther. And he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Now, let's do some simple math here. This is simple. I don't think you have to use common core. This is is basic math right here. How many men did he throw into the fire? How many men did he see walking around in the fire? How many walked out? Where Jesus? Where is he? Still in the fire. Still in the fire. Still in the fire. And, And I believe he's still in the fire, willing and ready to help us. See, when we go through the fire, he's just as present with us as he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because Hebrews 13, 8 says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He never abandons us ever, not even in the fire. Verse 27, then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed. How big of a miracle is that? Seriously, think about it. Ladies, you ever burnt your hair with a curling iron or a straightener? You you ever done that? Doesn't that smell? But right here, it says they're not even singed. Not even singed. And then this, this is crazy. I absolutely love this. They didn't even smell a smoke. How is that even possible? How? You you remember, if you're my age, you remember this. You remember we used to go to restaurants and they would ask you if you want to sit in the smoking or non-smoking section. Remember that? It didn't really matter where you sat, kind of like going to a pool. You like the peen or non-peen section. It all flows together. It doesn't even matter. Like, you can't stop it. So they put you at a table next to the smoking section, and you leave just smelling like smoke the rest of the night. You remember that? Well, the Bible says that their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. That's, that's amazing. Here, here's what I get out of this. When you go through the fire, Tough times are coming into your life. You're not even going to look like what the enemy wanted you to look like when you get to the other side. You're not going to smell like the enemy wanted you to smell like. What the enemy tried to put on you is going to be burned off of you when you walk through the fire with Jesus and others. Because that's who he is, and that's what he does. Didn't even smell a smoke. Hair wasn't even burned. And then watch this, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to to die. They defied. They defied. They together, the three of them, defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. Because we tried to fire a thing, and it didn't work. So we're just going to tear you apart. There is no other God who can rescue like this. There is no other God who can rescue. No other God can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the providence of Babylon. What the enemy meant for pain, God used for promotion. At the end of the day, here's what you need to know. No matter what you're going through, he's going to bring you out. I'm I'm not saying you're not going to go through the fire. You're probably going to go through the fire. I'm probably going to go through the fire. We're going to go through the fire. We're going to have days that are absolutely horrible. That's the reality of life. But he's going to bring us out. And when he does, we're not going to look the same way that we looked when we went in. Because when you went into the fire, you were bound. You're going to come out unbound. You're going to come out unharmed. You're going to come out with your head held high in victory, knowing that God can and will deliver us in his time, 
Not, not our time, in his time. Because he is God and he is good. L- let me end like this. Um, Claudia's going to come up here and she's going to lead us in a song. And it's a song that, that we know, a song called Even If. Um, we, we've sang it before, you've heard it on the radio. And we're going to end like this because we need to learn how to be a people who can say, even if. Just like these three guys, e- even if. E- even if, King, even if he doesn't do it, we're still not going to bow down. Even if he doesn't want to do what I want him to do, I'm still going to follow. C- can, you, can you do that? Can you be at a place where you say that? Even if. Even if God doesn't do what I want him to do, I'm still going to follow. Hey, God, I'm going to ask you to heal me, but even if you don't, I'm going to keep following. I'm going to ask God to take me from this situation, but even if he doesn't, I'm going to keep following. I'm going to ask God to take me away from this addiction, but even if he doesn't, I'm still going to follow. I'm going to ask God to take me out of it, but even if he doesn't, I'm still going to follow because I know I've got the help of Jesus. I know I've got the help of onboard people who will stand with me. Even if he doesn't, I will keep following. Can you say that? Can you be that person? Can we be those people together? Even if, even if he doesn't, I'm going to follow. Nothing can stop me. Nothing can slow me down because I've got the help of Jesus and I've got the help of other people. I'm on board with him. He's on board with me. I'm on board with with others. And so I know I can overcome because I know my Redeemer lives. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, I will follow because I'm not alone in this fire. Let's pray. God, we're so incredibly thankful for you and the work that you're doing in our lives through your son, Jesus Christ, with the power of your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us, you never abandon us. We thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And right now, God, I I pray that you would instill that into all of our hearts and remind us of that so that we could know that even when we're in the fire, if you don't move the way we want you to move, that you're still with us and we still need to follow God, help us to be people that say no no matter what, no matter what comes our way, we're going to focus our eyes on you, Jesus. We're going to put you first. We're going to follow you. God, we know times can be tough and and difficult. Help us in in the midst of the fire to stop, to look around, to see you, Jesus, to hear your voice. As we sing this song, we want to offer you an opportunity to, to, be, if there, to be prayed with or for. If there's something going on in your life that, that maybe, maybe you're having a tough time. Maybe you're having a tough time in the fire. Maybe you're having a tough time understanding who's on board, who's not on board, getting on board with God's plan, all of those things. Whatever it might be, whatever you might be struggling with, maybe you don't even know Jesus. Maybe you're stuck in the fire and you can't see him because you don't have a relationship with him. We would love to talk to you about that. So during this song, we'll ask you to to stand up or walk out of your aisle and walk out the back door. And there'll be people out there who will meet you, who will direct you up to our prayer room. There'll be people in there who would love to pray with you, pray for you, just talk with you about whatever it is you might be going through. Just, 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 Just be here to help you and to get on board with you. So if you need that during that song at any time, you just, you just walk out, you just go. God, we love you. We love you even if, even if you don't move the way that, that we want you to move. We love you because your plans for our lives are greater than our plans. And so help us to sell out to your plans and to, and, and, and to just throw ours off to the side. God, over the next several moments, we ask that you move in ways that only you can in the hearts of your people, through the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. Right now, right now I'm losing. 
easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down. What will I say when I'm held to the flames like I am right now? I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hands. But only takes a little faith to move a mountain. A good thing, a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, give me the strength to be able to sing in Oh my. 